Sega was one of the key players in the arcade market right from the start. By 1983, it became clear that the home consumer market could be a lucrative new direction for the company. They quickly retooled their SC3000 home computer into their first video game console, the SG-1000. It was launched the same day as Nintendo's more powerful 8-bit system. Despite the modest sales numbers of Sega's console, it was considered successful enough to pursue the consumer market. The following two years, they retooled and upgraded the SG-1000 into the Mark III, better known as the Master System. However, it was Nintendo's machine that took the world by storm. By 1986, Sega already realized it was a losing proposition, and they began working on the most powerful system in the universe. The Sega System 16 arcade board was used as a starting point, but whether they could afford to include a 16-bit processor was still in question. Luckily, they were able to strike a deal with chip manufacturer Motorola and use their popular 68,000 CPU as the heart of the system. After considering hundreds of names, the console was branded as the Mega Drive. A sleek black machine with a 16-bit emblem on its bonnet, this golden eye-catcher bumped up the production cost, but was an important symbol to state its power. In late 1988, it was ready to hit the market, but the timing couldn't be worse, as the highly anticipated Super Mario Bros. 3 was released that same week, stealing all of Sega's thunder. Signing up third parties was still a challenge for Sega, so it was up to their own consumer division to produce no less than 16 games within the first year. They operated largely in the shadows of the arcade division, and were often tasked with creating home console versions of arcade hits. Their original output, however, started to grow and kept the more experienced members occupied. It was clear Sega needed more hands and started recruiting young graduates. One of them was Noriyoshi Oba. After majoring in marketing statistics, he landed a job at Sega as a game planner, despite not having any knowledge on game development. For clarification, a planner in these days was essentially a team lead largely responsible for the overall game direction. The company was structured differently from Nintendo in this aspect, as new recruits were often put in leading roles. Oba quickly learned the tricks of the trade and was put in charge of a new entry in their popular Shinobi series, hardly a year after he was hired. The project started in 1989 and was called The Super Shinobi, also known as The Revenge of Shinobi. Up until this point, the arcade adaptations for the Mega Drive strayed little from their arcade counterparts in terms of gameplay. Oba recognized he had more creative freedom as a home console game designer, as the consumer lays down his cash up front. In contrast, the developers of the arcade sequel Shadow Dancer had to adapt gameplay to keep the player's quarters flowing. Not having to deal with these restrictions allowed Oba to add more variety and depth to the game experience. His goal was to give the player a sense of freedom on how to tackle obstacles in the game, and the multiple types of ninjutsu magic were key in this. The unique self-sacrificing magic is a fine example. This technique costs an extra life, but gives the player full health in return, and deals massive damage to on-screen enemies. It's up to the strategy of the player to decide when staying alive is worth a spare life. Another key focus of the game design was to gradually improve the player's skills. The famous scene in Chinatown forces you to perfect your double jump in a safe environment in order to prepare you for a difficult platforming stage ahead. Alternatively, a bonus ninjutsu is hidden at the same section, subtly reminding the player of their levitation magic. More perceptive players might have noticed that the shield magic nullifies kickbacks after being hit, making it also very useful in dangerous platforming sections. Again, this fit in with the concept to give the player freedom of choice. Oba made sure to add a dose of variety by adding different challenges in each level. He took the 2.5D game mechanic from the arcade game and mixed it up with new challenges. Thanks to the new render priority feature of the Mega Drive video chip, they were able to pull this off on a home console and allow Musashi to jump into the background. Game designer Noriyoshi Oba was joined by four programmers and three artists. Now Hiro Warama, a self-taught artist who had just joined Sega, became the chief designer on the project aided by two part-time artists, one of them being Takashi Yuda, whose career was kickstarted by the project. He was to continue to work on big Sega releases. Grounding the over-the-top 80s flick action with realistic artwork was one of the main goals of the art team. This in and of itself was a departure from most other software on the market. Characters were realistically proportioned in contrast with the cartoon-esque portrayal in other games. Joe Musashi was redesigned and given white ninja robes, as they felt black made him look like a villain. With only half a megabyte of cartridge space, memory was scarce, even with the clever compression algorithms implemented by the programmers. 
the team decided to leave out a bonus stage in return for more set pieces. By reusing background tiles in various stages, and the clever use of the flip functionality, they were able to save some memory for the opening sequence. The art team didn't have to look far for reference material. Jo Musashi was directly based on none other than the legendary Hattori Hanzo, a fictional character from the Japanese 80s TV show Shadow Warrior, played by famed martial artist actor Sunny Chiba. Like with all creative endeavors, video games heavily reflect the time in which they were created. Whatever you're exposed to as a creator often directly influences your own productions. 80s pop culture therefore left a big footprint on Sega's games from that decade. The familiar themes resonated with an international audience, encouraging Sega to keep tapping from this pool of inspiration. Revenge of Shinobi would continue the East meets West theme of the original. Oba based the enemies directly on pop culture characters, not necessarily out of lack of creativity, but to give it an authentic movie feel. The young pixel artist took his rough ideas perhaps too literally, which resulted in a faithful pixel art representation of a number of movie icons. For composer Yuzo Koshiro, Revenge of Shinobi would also be a key project in his career. The composer learned to play piano from his mother at a young age, and was taught by Joe Hisaishi, who would go on to work on Studio Ghibli films. The arcade scene got him interested in game music and sparked his idea to replicate the tunes at home with his own audio tools. After his first successes at Falcom, he decided to go freelance. To broaden his horizons, he made a trip to LA in the late 80s to get exposed to the latest pop music trends abroad. Groups like Inner City were successful in bringing house music into the mainstream. Madonna had recently released her latest album, Like a Prayer. The video clip for the single Express Yourself featured a Shep Pettibone house remix. Yuzo took notice of this new dance style for future projects and bought numerous cassettes as inspiration. Back in Japan, he was contracted by Sega to compose music for the new Shinobi game. Oba had clear ideas for the sound effects, but when it came to the music, his only request was to make it sound unconventional as far as video game soundtracks go. Koshiro's interest in contemporary pop and dance music made him the perfect man to give Sega's action series a more mature feel and complement the new realistic art style. The track for the opening stage demonstrated his fusion of dance and traditional Japanese music. Koshiro was no stranger to the audio hardware inside the console. The NEC PC88 had a similar FM chip and had been his hardware of choice for years. He used his own tool called Mucom88 to give him the freedom he needed. To give his soundtrack a strong drum foundation, he used the limited sample playback functionality of the console. This set it apart from most early Mega Drive games on the market, which merely used it for voices or sound effects. Go, go, go with a smile. While Koshiro was working on the music, Bat Dance by Prince was topping the charts. It didn't go unnoticed by Koshiro, as the funky dance tunes directly influenced a couple of tracks. Revenge of Shinobi would be a direct sequel in terms of storyline. The game designers decided to add a personal touch by making Naoko, Musashi's lover, the hostage of a crime organization known as Neo Zed. The story behind her name actually reflected the work ethic and free spirit of the team. Noriyoshi Oba was on the phone with his wife during another late night at the office. One of the developers overheard his phone call and suddenly heard Oba's wife screaming to her younger sister, Naoko, what's wrong? He jokingly opted to name the character after her. Development went by pretty smoothly, despite being new to the 16-bit hardware. They could rely on test routines from the Mega Drive hardware team to bring them up to speed. At the end of the project, some ideas had to be cut, most notably a secret final boss who ran Neo Zed. This would turn out to be Musashi's own master, whom he believed had died in his arms. After roughly six months of production, the game was ready to hit store shelves in late 89. The clever insight by Oba to deviate from its arcade roots had paid off, and the game quickly became a necessary acclaimed hit in the Mega Drive game library. All pop culture characters were still present in the first batch of cartridges. Development was less structured and less controlled by sales and legal departments back in these days. It took a while before someone at Sega requested to change some of the characters to avoid lawsuits. 
Coincidentally, Sega of America had just acquired the Spider-Man license to produce games around the superhero. Spider-Man could therefore remain in the updated Western release and was even further tweaked to his likeness. After finishing Revenge of Shinobi, Ova and a couple of the staff members started to tackle the adaptation of eSWAT, an arcade game with the same gameplay principles as Shinobi. For the Mega Drive release, the game was once again changed drastically to better suit the home console experience. eSWAT was released in the summer of 1990, and it was around this time that Oba discussed a new game with composer Yuzo Koshiro, inspired by Double Dragon, Final Fight, and hit series The A-Team. Young game designer Hiroaki Chino joined the project, and together they wrote a detailed design document for their game, codenamed D-SWAT. Many of the key elements like the control scheme, enemies, and multiple endings were already part of this plan. After getting the approval from management, Oba took his E-SWAT team and began working on this important title. The name D-SWAT was dropped and changed to Bare Knuckle, or Streets of Rage as it's known in the West. There would still be a link with E-SWAT by including the police car from the end credits but with a more prominent role. Like their previous games, the art style would be realistic and gritty compared to the competition. Extra care was put into the game mechanics. Crowd control is an important part of beat-em-up gameplay, and therefore new moves were added to Streets of Rage to further deepen this aspect. Players could grab an enemy and swing across them to reposition themselves, or use the back attack. Yuzo Koshiro's waxing interest in the latest club music helped to shape one of the defining aspects of the game, its soundtrack. He predicted that the game would perform well in the West and thought the new club sound would fit well with the game and its target audience. The Eurohouse acts, but also the smooth sounds of Neo Soul and the new swing beat genre were a rich source of inspiration for the composer. but it would still be a challenge to replicate this sound with the Mega Drive sound chips. He sampled the drum sounds from the famed Roland drum machine to produce that instant authenticity. Drawing from the latest music trends and selecting the right beats and grooves that fit perfectly with the game was one of Koshiro's defining strengths at that time. Sega of Japan contracted Yoshiaki Yoneshima to paint the cover art. He was well acquainted with Sega and had already delivered some of the most iconic box art for the system. For the Western release, Sega of America turned to Greg Winters, a freelance illustrator who worked for Capcom and Sega during the early 90s. Streets of Rage wrapped up in the fall of 1990. The following years would be a whirlwind of change for Sega's consumer division, catapulting them out of the shadows of the arcade team. The new Sonic game hit big in the West, and the plan to transfer talent to a new US development studio was put in motion. The Game Gear and Mega CD add-on also divided the focus of Sega's internal team. As a result, the sequels to their hits Revenge of Shinobi and Streets of Rage had to be outsourced, with Oba only involved in an advisory role. Yuzo's own development company handled Streets of Rage 2 and managed to do a stellar job at that. The new Shinobi game would be largely outsourced to a small, low-profile studio, Megasoft. They were involved with the Mega Drive right from the start and acquired by Sega in 1991. After handling the Mega Drive adaptation of arcade hit Toki, Megasoft was put on the development of Revenge of Shinobi 2, despite not having any big names on the team. Their first act was to give Joe Musashi a wider range of moves. Running, wall jumps, climbing, and flying kicks all spiced up the gameplay. The 80s was well in the past at this point, and thus the overall feel of the game would be different. The music was handled by Megasoft's own audio team, leading to a different but nonetheless excellent score. By November of 92, the game was starting to take shape and ready to be reviewed by the gaming press. As part of Sega's new strict regulations due to the leaking of early Sonic 2 builds, they no longer sent out review copies. Instead, gaming press was invited to Sega's office to come and play the game, rebranded to Shinobi 3. They reviewed it positively, but criticized the lack of variety and inconsistent level quality of background art. The team at Sega reviewed the game internally and came to the conclusion that it was not up to the standards of its predecessor. Shinobi wasn't considered one of the big sellers for the year and was only allocated a modest marketing budget, making it easier to postpone its release by half a year and push it back in production. 
the newcomer Tomoyuki Ito, who just moved from Data East, was asked to step in and lead the project. He set out to redesign the stages to make better use of Musashi's new moves and add more cinematic flair to the game. The coming months, the project underwent a complete overhaul. The core gameplay was left intact, but the levels and game structure were drastically changed. One of the key points to keep the game from becoming boring is to constantly evoke different feelings in the players. The new action sequences added a sense of excitement, while the rebuild bioplant level added tension and fear. Megasoft was situated at the same building as the new startup Treasure. This studio, set up by ex-Konami employees, was hard at work with the development of their first title, Gunstar Heroes, backed up by Sega to do the publishing. The Treasure guys were relatively new to the Mega Drive hardware, but managed to quickly push it to its limits. Treasure shared their progress on Gunstar Heroes and their programming tricks with the Shinobi 3 team. Their advice was used to implement the new cinematic action sequences. Overall, roughly 50% of the levels would end up being completely redesigned, and the other half underwent major touch-ups. The inferior urban levels were removed, and the airship level was redone entirely. The extra time also allowed the team to add more effects and further improve the graphics. Some already existing enemies like the Tiger were sacrificed. He was part of the cover art created half a year prior and thus had to be removed, leaving a blank spot in the illustration. The polished, action-packed game was ready to ship in the summer of 93. Despite the improvements, magazines gave it roughly the same score as half a year earlier. Shinobi 3 fell victim to the changing interest within the video game landscape as the eyes of consumers, reviewers, and marketing were focused on big new franchises like Sonic, Jurassic Park, and Aladdin, as well as fighters like Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter 2. Shinobi 3 therefore didn't top the charts like its predecessor did. Afterwards, Megasoft was completely merged with Sega. Meanwhile, Noriyoshi Oba rejoined with his original Streets of Rage 1 development team to develop Part 3 in their Brawler franchise. Because most of the Streets of Rage 2 team would not be involved, it would differ slightly in playstyle and overall feel. Axel, Blaze, Skate, and their new partner Dr. Zan were given new moves to further deepen the gameplay. A theme in Noriyoshi Oba's games had always been the multiple endings, and with this third installment he could finally execute the concept in a more elaborate way. Yuzo Koshiro and his fellow Streets of Rage 2 composer Motohiro Kawashima were inspired by the latest techno trends in Europe, in particular successful bands like The Prodigy. In the underground scene, Aphex Twin and Autekar were part of a new wave, producing experimental electronic music sometimes referred to as Intelligent Techno, or IDM. One of the characteristics of this genre were randomized sequences generated by a computer. Koshiro also adopted this technique and used an auto-music composition system to generate rhythms you ordinarily could never imagine on your own. The result was another groundbreaking, yet divisive, video game score. Streets of Rage 3 wrapped up by the end of 93. The game underwent numerous tweaks for the Western release, some more justifiable than others. For Oba, Streets of Rage 3 finalized the 16-bit era, and he started to turn his attention to the Sega Saturn. Yuzo Koshiro and his development studio would continue working on one last Mega Drive title, the action-adventure game The Story of Thor. This widely renowned game with its orchestral soundtrack would showcase Yuzo's skill as a composer and range of styles. Traditional beat-em-ups and 2D action platformers were starting to fall out of fashion, but Streets of Rage and Revenge of Shinobi had their moment to shine and leave a lasting impression on many Mega Drive fans. Both titles were important selling points for Sega in the days before Sonic. Although Oba and Koshiro drew from contemporary trends, their strong vision and execution made the games transcend generations.